This week's reading consists of Jacob chapters 1 through 4. And so let's take a look at what these chapters teach us and how we can better come unto Christ. Let's begin with Jacob, chapter 1 through 4, an introduction. Jacob was one of the great apostles of the Book of Mormon on. As a special witness, he bore a perfect testimony. He entertained angels and was an eyewitness of the Redeemer. Even in his youth, this son of Lehi knew the redeeming powers of his Savior and beheld the Lord's glory. Tutored by his father and his brother, Prophet Nephi, Jacob learned to feast upon the holy words from the days of his childhood and thereby gained a familiarity with that spirit known only to the obedient and the ser serious student of Scripture. In the role of a doctrinal teacher, there were few greater. Jacob has left us a store of theological gems. Only Nephi, Mormon, and Moroni contain more to this volume of holy writ known as the Book of Mormon. Jacob spoke of the need for men everywhere to believe in Christ, view his death and, his suffer, and suffer his cross. He, ap he appended his witness of the Lord to that of all the holy prophets since the world began. Being a student and follower of his prophetic predecessors, Jacob spoke of the need for men and women to worship the Father in the name of the Son, to recognize and acknowledge that all things bear witness to the Messiah, and that through cultivating the spirit of revelation, Persons of the household of faith may obtain a hope in Christ and become unshaken in their faith. Further, from the vivid description of Jacob's encounter with Sherem, those of the last days can learn how they to identify, expose, and confound the enemies of Christ. As a vigilant watchman on the tower, Jacob raised a warning voice against sin that echoes through the ages. He exemplified the teacher who has cleansed his own garments of the blood and sins of his generation by his forthright and powerful exposition of the truth. His plea, like that of his master, was for the saints to seek first to build up the kingdom of God and to establish its righteousness. His words were and are as the mountain peaks rising in pure air above the smog and pollution of a secular and relativistic world. Jacob was too kind to be so cruel as to allow pride and immorality among his people to go unchecked. He was constrained by the power of the Spirit to condemn forthrightly the soul-destructive and baneful influences of immodesty and unchastity. With Syriac vision, Jacob spans through the eyes of Zenos, his ancient counterpart, the history of besieged and beleaguered Israel and the destiny that awaits them in their eventual return to the covenant of their fathers. His prophecy in concert with Zeno was a proclamation of hope, a message of consolation. God will not forget his ancient covenant people. In this record, Jacob himself, a child of the wilderness, unites his testimony with that of his brother Nephi, teaching all men to chart a safe course out of the wilderness of sin into the rest of the Lord. Wherefore we would to God that we could persuade all men not to rebel against God, to provoke him to anger, but that all men would believe in Christ. So with that introduction, let's go to Jacob chapter 1. Chapter 1, verses 2 through 8, Jacob's purpose in writing. Notice that Jacob had the same intent that his brother did as he prepared to continue keeping the record on the small plates. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles put Jacob's tent in intent into perspective. Quote, Jacob seems to have been particularly committed to presenting the doctrine of Christ. Given the amount of space he gave to his witness of the Savior's atonement, Jacob clearly considered this basic doctrine the most sacred of teachings and the greatest of revelations. We had many revelations in the spirit of prophecy, Jacob said. Wherefore, we knew of Christ in his kingdom, which should come. Wherefore we labored diligently among our people, that we might persuade them to come unto Christ. Wherefore we would to God that all men would believe in Christ, and view his death, and suffer his cross, and bear the shame of the world. No prophet in the Book of Mormon, by temperament or personal testimony, seems to have gone about that work of persuasion more faithfully than did Jacob. He scorned the praise of the world, he taught straight, solid, even painful doctrine, and he knew the Lord personally. 
His is a classic Book of Mormon example of a young man's decision to suffer the cross and bear the shame of the world in defense of the name of Christ. Life, including those difficult early years when he saw the wickedness of Laman and Lamiel bring his father and mother down to the grave in grief, was never easy for this firstborn in the wilderness. End of Elder, Elder Holland's quote. First Nephi chapter 1, the phrase Nephi gave Jacob a commandment. Meaning Jacob, a noble and righteous man, a man filled with the spirit of prophecy and revelation, was the natural choice to steward the records begun by Nephi. Therefore, the records would most frequently pass from father to son. Could it be that Nephi had no surviving sons? Uh, that's an interesting point, because we know it did go from father into son, and perhaps Nephi had no surviving sons. And so he commits it to his brother Jacob to continue the small plates of Nephi. Chapter 1, verse 5, the phrase, because of faith and great anxiety, meant because of their faith and understanding the gospel of Christ, the Nephite prophets desired above all else that their people taste of its richness and goodness and avoid the bitter fruits of disobedient. These feelings of anxiety are mirrored in the desire of righteous parents of all generations. Nothing is greater import to them that their children choose to walk those paths which lead to happiness. Chapter 1, verse 7. A couple of different phrases we'll consider in this verse. First, the phrase, come unto Christ. The anxiety of Book of Mormon prophets finds no more eloquent expression than the invitation for all men to come unto Christ. Such is the purpose of the Book of Mormon. Such is the purpose of the restored gospel in these latter days. Mormonism has no other purpose. All else that we do is but an appendage to this testimony and message. The phrase, that they might enter into his rest, referred to, to enter into the rest of the Lord in this life is to be possessed of the quiet but powerful assurance that the work in which we are engaged is true, that the Lord and Savior reigns, that he has restored his holy gospel through Joseph Smith in these latter days, and that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is in the line of its duty, that it is led by true servants of the Lord, and that the God of heaven has appropriately empowered his oracles in this day to represent him. It is to know the peace of spiritual certainty, and thus to be immune to the taunting waves of ridicule and skepticism. We qualify for the rest of God hereafter through faithful obedience by meeting the challenges of mortality and eventually inheriting the promise of eternal life the assurance of the fullness of the glory of the Father in the world to come. The phrase, the provocation in the days of temptation, this phrase is referring to, at Sinai, the children of Israel spurned the privileges of the everlasting gospel and the greater priesthood and thereby rejected the higher counsel which might have been had from the lips of Jehovah through Moses the lawgiver. They provoked their Lord and robbed themselves of the sublime association with that holy being who was the God of the Covenant Fathers. Paul warned the Meridian Saints of such spiritual folly, as did the Lord through Joseph Smith of those of our day in a great revelation on priesthood. So when the children of Israel and Moses came down and they were worshiping the golden calf that Aaron had made, realized they were not ready for the ordinances of the Melchizedek priesthood or the Melchizedek priesthood. And so on that day, they provoked the Lord to give them a lesser law to help them come unto Christ. And so that's what the provocation in the days of temptation means, that they were not ready for the Melchizedek priesthood and its ordinances. Chapter 1, verse 8, some phrases we will consider first. The phrase, not to rebel against God, to provoke him to anger, means God's anger is his righteous use of justice. If we rebel against God, then in God's perfect justice, he will bring upon them righteous judgment, destruction, consequences for their rebellion. That's all that God's anger is, is having to now face the consequences of disobeying God. 
He's not mad. He's not huffing and puffing. And he's not trying to smite out of vengeance or anger, but because the law of justice says that consequences must come for their rebellion. If we want the blessings of God instead of the destruction that comes from rebellion from him, then we must learn to use our agency wisely. For men are free according to the flesh, and all things are given them which are expedient unto man. And they are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. For he seeketh that all men might be miserable like unto himself. And now, my sons, I would that ye should look to the great mediator, and hearken unto his great commandments, and be faithful unto his words, and choose eternal life according to the holy will, and to the will of his Holy Spirit. That was Second Nephi two twenty seven through twenty eight, as Lehi is teaching his family. So provoking God's anger is that we choose misery and captivity instead of eternal life. The phrase believe in Christ meant to believe in Christ is more than an intellectual admission that he exists, more than recognition of his historical reality. It is to acknowledge his divine sonship, to know by the witness of the Spirit that he is God's almighty Son, and that salvation is to be found in and through his name and in no other way. So believing in Christ can only come by revelation, being revealed of who Christ is. The phrase, view his death, referred to, Jacob desires that all men view Christ's death. That is, he would that we should all see the suffering and death and resurrection of the Master as the pivotal event in history and in our own lives, that all view the atonement of Jesus Christ with the eye of faith, resulting in godly sorrow for sin and that we all see the Savior for who and what he is, and come to that sure knowledge which sanctifies the soul. The phrase, suffer his cross, refers to, to suffer the cross of Christ is to be willing to bear the burdens of Christian discipleship, particularly of crucifying the old man of sin and putting on Christ. If any man will come unto me, Jesus taught his Meridian 12, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And now for a man to take up his cross is to deny himself all ungodliness and every worldly lust and keep my commandments. So to suffer his cross, brothers and sisters, is for us to suffer those things that will come upon us as we try to be faithful that Satan will put in our way, that we're willing to suffer the temptations, the afflictions, the trials that come our way, just as the Savior did. The phrase, bear the shame of the world, referred to, he who aspires to fellowship with the suffering servant, meaning Christ, must be willing to endure humi hum humiliation, to lay down his all, his character and repu reputation, his honor and applause, his good name among men, his house, his lands, his brothers and sisters, his wife and children, and even his own life also, counting all things but filth and dross for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. In other words, can we fully submit to the will of Christ and we're willing to lay down and give up everything for him? He must learn to walk with confidence amidst the shouts of scorn from those in the great and spacious building. When people trust in the Lord, their gaze is not diverted from the captain of their souls, for they know full well that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory of which shall be revealed to us. That's in Romans. Brothers and sisters, we will be fully compensated and more so for the sufferings we go through here for Christ with the glory that we'll receive in exaltation. Chapter 1, verse 10, the phrase, having wielded the sword of Laban. We have no account of Nephi's, Nephi's battles with the Lamanites, Nephi's battle with the Lamanites, nor of his use of the sword of Laban in defense of his people. These matters were no doubt have occupied an important place on the large plates of Nephi. 
We know that they battled the Lamanites, but we don't have any record of Nephi actually going to battle, even though he does say that they did go to battle. Jacob is at pain to note not just that Nephi wielded the sword in defense of his people, but that he wielded the sword of Laban. The sword of Laban, which was the pattern used by the nation of the Nephites in forging their own swords, became an important symbol to that nation. The sword was emblematic of the arm of the Lord, a promise that he would strengthen and bless them as he had their fathers. It was a reminder that there was a price to be paid, even the shedding of blood, that the word of God might be had and honored. The symbolism associated with the sword of Laban reaches to our day. The three witnesses of the Book of Mormon were promised that they would see the sword of Laban, as well as the gold plates, the breastplates, and the Urim and Thummim. That's in Doctrine and Covenants 17. An incident recounted by Brigham Young affirms that the protective hand of the Lord remains extended in behalf of his people and over his sacred records. President Young tells that Oliver Cowdery accompanied Joseph Smith when the later returned the plates to the hill Camorra. Brigham Young said, quote, They laid the plates on a table. It was a large table that stood in the room within the hill. Under this table were a pile of plates as much as two feet high, and there were altogether in this room more plates than probably many wagon loads. They were piled up in the corners and along the walls. The first time they went there, the sword of Laban hung on the wall. When they went there again, it had been taken down and laid on the table across the gold plates. It was unsheathed, and on it was written these words, quote, this sword shall never be sheathed again until the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our God and his Christ, meaning when Christ reigns during the millennium. End of President Brigham Young. Quote. First, uh, Jacob 1, chapter 1, verses 13 through 14, the phrase Lamanite versus Nephites meant. After a time, lineage became irrelevant in the determination of who was a Nephite and who was a Lamanite. The Lamanites were any of those who chose to rebel against righteousness, against the things of God. On the other hand, whosoever would not believe in the tradition of the Lamanites, but believed those records that were brought out of the land of Jerusalem, and also in the tradition of their fathers, which were correct, who believed in the commandments of God and kept them, were called the Nephites, or the people of Nephi. So you could have converted Lamanites who are now called Nephites. And you could have dissenting Nephites who go over to Lamanites and now are called Lamanites. Chapter 1, verse 15, what is a concubine? Concubines in the Old Testament were considered to be secondary wives, that is, wives who did not have the same standing in the caste system, then them prevailing as did those wives who were not called concubines. Concubines had full protection as wives and did not violate the law of chastity when the marriages were approved by the Lord. You can see that in DNC 132. During the time period of the Book of Mormon, however, concubines were not approved by the Lord. The phrase began to grow hard in their hearts and indulge themselves somewhat in wicked practices means, in other words, they seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way, and after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world, and whose substance is that of an idol, which waxeth old, and shall perish in Babylon, even Babylon the Great, which shall fall. Doctrine and Covenants 1.16 So they began to walk after their way, not the Lord's way. And we can see in Doctrine and Covenants 116 that that will be the same temptation today in the church. That members will start not establishing the Lord's righteousness, but every man walketh in, in his own way. We must be willing to submit to God's way. Chapter 1, verse 16, the phrase, search much gold and silver. Jacob explains that many of the people began to search for silver and gold, meaning, presumably, that they began to worship mammon rather than God, since their searching caused them to be lifted up in pride. Jacob is not saying having silver and gold is bad, 
What he's saying is that by the term searching means that that became the focus of their lives. That's what they focused on was becoming wealthy and getting gold and silver, which lifted them up in pride instead of seeking the kingdom of God first. We should always put first our focus is on Christ. Chapter 1, verse 17, the phrase, Having first obtained mine errand from the Lord, meant, In our day, and surely whenever the kingdom of God has been on earth, the word of the Lord is sure, quoting DNC 42.11, It shall not be given to anyone to go forth to preach my gospel or build up my church, except he be ordained by someone who has authority. And it is known to the church that he has authority and has regularly has been regularly ordained by the heads of the church. So Jacob's telling he first obtained his error from the Lord, meaning he has been set apart and ordained to teach by his brother Nephi. As there can be no priesthood of all believers, pretense to authority by virtue of an appeal to the Bible alone, so there can be no secret commission in the Lord's kingdom pretense to position or authority on the strength of private ordination or confidential conversations. In discussing this principle, that a man or woman must be called of God as a safeguard against deceit or misrepresentation, as a Boyd K. Packer explained, quote, there are those who claim authority from some secret ordination of the past. Even now, some claim special revealed authority to lead or to teach the people. Occasionally, they use the name of members of the First Presidency or of the Twelve or of the Seventy and imply some special approval of what they teach. There have been too many names presented, too many sustaining votes taken, too many ordinations and set-aparts performed before too many witnesses. There have been too many records kept, too many certificates prepared, and too many pictures published in too many places for anyone to be deceived as to who holds the proper authority. Claims of special revelation or secret authority from the Lord or from the brethren are false on the face of them and really utter nonsense. The Lord never operated that way. These things were not done in a quarter, it says in Acts 26. There is light on every official call and every authorized ordination and it has always been that way. End of quote. So if someone claims to have received some special ordination or teaching from someone, no, that is not of God. It is of the devil. Chapter 1, verse 18, the phrase consecrated priest and teachers. President Joseph Fielding Smith defined the kind of priests and teachers that were referred to in Jacob 1, 18, quote, the Nephites officiated by virtue of the Melchizedek priesthood from the days of Lehi to the days of the appearing of the Savior among them. This is because there were no Levites that went there. And they are the ones that hold the Aaronic priesthood. So they had no Aaronic priesthood because there was no Levites among the Lamanites and Nephites. And so they functioned by the authority of the Melchizedek priesthood of the prophets. It is true that Nephi consecrated Jacob and Joseph, that they should be priests and teachers over the land of the Nephites. But the fact that plural terms priests and teachers were used indicates that this was not a reference to the definite office in the priesthood in either case, but it was a general assignment to teach, direct, and admonish the people. So when Jacob and Joseph were made priests and teachers, and not that's not one of the they're not being made priests and teachers of the wrong priesthood. They're just being ordained as priests and teachers over the people generally, functioning under the direction of the Melchizedek priesthood. Chapter one, verses nineteen, and then chapter two, verse two, both has the phrase answering the sins of the people upon our own heads. This phrase referred to Individuals who have a responsibility to lead in the church shoulder a sobering responsibility. Jacob taught that when a leader neglects to teach the word of God to those whom he is called to lead, he becomes partly responsible for their sins. President Hubie Brown of the First Presidency elaborated on the responsibility Jacob described, quote, President John Taylor said on one occasion, speaking to the brethren of the priesthood, If you do not magnify your callings, God will hold you responsible for those you might have saved, have you done your duty. 
This is a challenging statement. If I, by reason of sin, of commission or omission, lose what I might have had in hereafter, I myself must suffer, and doubtless my loved ones with me. But if I fail in my assignment as a bishop, a stake president, a mission president, or one of the general authorities of the church, if any of us fail to teach, lead, direct, and help to save those under our direction and within our jurisdiction, then the Lord will hold us responsible if they are lost as a result of our failure. So leadership positions, brothers and sisters, are serious business in the Lord's church. End of his quote. Not that last part I just added, but chapter 1, verse 19, the phrase, their blood might not come upon our garments, meant Jacob had spoken earlier, O my brethren, remember my words. Behold, I take off my garments and I shake them before you. I pray the God of my salvation that he view me with all his searching eye. Wherefore, ye shall know at the last day when all men shall be judged of their works, that the God of Israel did witness that I shook your iniquities from my soul, and that I stand with brightness before him and am rid of your blood. So this was just a symbolic way of Jacob saying, I have done my part as leader. I have preached and I have taught. And so your sins are shaken from off of me. You are now held responsible for all of what you do. He is not. He fulfilled his responsibility. The phrase, we did magnify our office unto the Lord, meant while discussing the duty of priesthood holders to serve, President Thomas S. Monson explained, quote, what does it mean to magnify a calling? It means to build it up in dignity and importance, to make it honorable and con commendable in the eyes of all men, to enlarge and strengthen it, to let the light of heaven shine through it to the view of other men. And how does one magnify a calling? Simply by performing the service that pertains to it. An elder magnifies the ordained call of an elder by learning what his duties as an elder are and then by doing them. As with an elder, so with a deacon, a teacher, a priest, a, priest, a bishop, and each who holds offices in the priesthood. End of quote. Jacob, let's go to chapter 2 now. Chapter 2, verse 5. Let's take a look at some phrases in this verse. First, the phrase, the all-powerful creator of heaven and earth, referred to. Scriptures make no concession to the idea of any power or force greater than God. Of our God, the scriptures attest, this is 88, the NC 88, he comprehendeth all things, and all things are before him, and all things are round about him, and he is above all things, and in all things, and is through all things, and is round about all things, and all things are by him, and of him, even God forever and ever. No wonder Christ has all knowledge, and the Father as he is in, through, under, about, above all things. The fact that Elohim is the exalted man of holiness, that he was once as we are now, does not mean that he does not know all things, that he does not have all power, and that by the light of Christ he is not in and through all things. No, he does know all things. He does have all power, and through the light of Christ he is through all things. From modern revelation we know, and we know that the prophets of old knew, that there is a God in heaven who is infinite and eternal, from everlasting to everlasting, the same unchangeable God, the framer of heaven and earth, and all things which are in them. DNC 20. The phrase, I can tell you concerning your thoughts. The gift of the sermon, as well as the spirit of prophecy and revelation, is the rightful providence of those on the Lord's errand. They come to see and know things not visible to the natural man. Like their master, they too can read the hearts and minds of men. The phrase, beginning to labor in sin, referred to, the sins of the people in Jacob's day were not inadvertent transgressions. They had begun to labor in sin, in the sense that sin had become their obsession and their preoccupation. They had begun to flirt with that spirit which characterized the wickedness of the days of Noah, which Noah said, and every man was lifted up in the imagination and the thoughts of his heart, being only evil continually. And so the Nephites are now beginning to labor in sin. Can you imagine that? 
purposely laboring to sin. Chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Admonish according to the strict commands of God. That phrase means, rather than teach the word which healeth the wounded soul, Jacob 2, 8, or speak of the pleasing word of God, verse 9, Jacob felt compelled by the Lord to address a subject that regretfully would enlarge the wounds of those who were already wounded. Verse 9. Sometimes blunt and challenging words are necessary when a priesthood leader cries repentance to church members. I can't remember which conference. It's been either a year or two ago when the first talk by President Nelson, the prophet of the church, gave he talked about how there is abuse, sexual, physical, mental, emotional abuse in the church, and it needs to stop now. That is not a good way we want our prophet to start a general conference talk. But he knew he had to be blunt. We need to knock it off, brothers and sisters. Stop the abuse in the church. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles described the challenging balance of teaching the truth both sensitively and boldly. Quote, Jacob spent much of ten full verses apologizing, in effect, for the sins he must address and the language he must use in addressing them. He notes that he does so with soberness, being weighed down with much more in desire and anxiety for the welfare of his hearers' souls. Knowing him as we do, we would be surprised if he had said otherwise. Listen to the mournful tone of these passages, literally the grief of them, as he single-mindedly pursues what he has always been single-minded about, steadfast loyalty to God and his commandments. And now, Elder Holland quotes Jacob, Yea, it grieveth my soul, and causeth me to shrink with shame before the presence of my Maker, that I must testify unto you concerning the wickedness of your hearts. Wherefore, it burneth my soul that I should be constrained because of the strict commandment which I have received from God to admonish you according to your crimes, to enlarge the wounds of those who are already wounded, instead of consoling and healing their wounds. And those who have not been wounded, instead of feasting upon the pleasing word of God, have daggers placed to pierce their souls and wound their delicate minds. That was Jacob he quoted. Now, Elder Holland says, We are not even in the discourse, per se, before we sense that quite literally, this bold and unyielding manner of preaching is almost as hard on Jacob as it is on the guilty ones in his audience. But perhaps that is as it should be always, and why Christ in his preaching was oftentimes a man of sorrows. The commandments have to be kept, sin has to be rebuked, but even such bold positions must be taken compassionately. Even the sternest of prophets must preach from the depths of a sensitive soul. End of Elder Holland's quote. Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that when priesthood leaders feel constrained, that meaning compelled, by the Spirit to give admonitions and warnings, members of the church have a responsibility to act upon the correction and instruction given to them. Quote, Last week I was talking with a member of the Quorum of the Twelve about comments we had received on our April conference talks. My friend said, someone told him, I surely enjoyed your talk. We agreed that this is not the kind of comment we like to receive. Isn't that an interesting statement by Elder uh, Oaks? And here's why. As my friend said, I didn't give that talk to be enjoyed. What does he think? I am some kind of entertainer? Another member of our quorum joined the conversation by saying, That reminds me of the story of a good minister. When a parishioner said, I surely enjoyed your sermon today, the minister replied, in that case, you didn't understand it. You must remember that this April conference, I spoke on pornography. This is by Elder Oaks. No one told me they enjoyed that talk, not one. In fact, there was nothing enjoyable in it, even for me. 
I speak of these recent conversations to teach the principle that a message given by a general authority at a general conference, a message prepared under the influence of the Spirit to further the work of the Lord, is not given to be enjoyed. It is given to inspire, to edify, to challenge, or to correct. It is given to be heard under the influence of the Spirit with the intended result that the listener learns from the talk and from the Spirit what he should what he or she should do about it, end of quote. So maybe that will tell us whether we've been inspired by the Spirit as we listen to conference, that we gain some new insight on what I must do in my life, and not that, oh, that was just an enjoyable talk. Chapter 2, verse 11, the phrase, As I inquired of the Lord, meant the power of Jacob's message lies in the simple fact that he was a true messenger of the Father. He inquired of the Lord, sought out the will, divine will, asked of God. The choice of message was not his. He sought to say and do only what the Lord would have said and done under similar circumstances. The same is true with our First Presidency, the Quorum of the Twelve and Seventy and General Conference. They are not given topics. They seek out the will of the Lord. Chapter 2, verses 12 through 19. The phrase, Before you seek for riches. Jacob taught that God does not condemn the wealthy for the riches. Instead, any condemnation comes from their pride or misuse of their abundance. Some of the people of Nephi chose riches rather than God as the center of their lives. Their search for wealth led them to persecute their brethren rather than assist them. President David O. McKay counseled us to be cautious regarding that which we seek. Though we may obtain almost anything we work for, it may come at a high price. Quote, he said, What seek ye first? What do you cherish as the dominant, the uppermost thought in your mind? What this is will largely determine your destiny. You may win in this world almost anything for which you strive. If you work for wealth, you can get it. But before you make it an end in itself, Take a look at those men who have sacrificed all to accomplishment of this purpose, at those who have desired wealth for the sake of wealth itself. God does not corrupt man. It is in the motive of acquiring that gold that corruption occurs. End of quote. God is not against us having riches. He is against us focusing upon our riches and becoming corrupted and prideful. We, continue his quote, continuing President, uh, who was it? President McKay. We want our children, their children, to know that the choice of life is not between fame and obscurity, nor is the choice between wealth and poverty. The choice is between good and evil, and that is a very different matter indeed. When we finally understand this lesson, thereafter our happiness will not be determined by material things. We may be happy without them, or successful in spite of them. Wealth and promise do not always come from having earned them. Our worth is not measured by renown or by what we own. Our lives are made up of thousands of everyday choices. Over the years, these little choices will be bundled together and show clearly what we value. The crucial test of life, I repeat, does not center in the choices between fame and obscurity, nor between wealth and poverty. The greatest decisions of life is between good and evil. End of quote. Among the timeless lessons we learn from the Book of Mormon are the perils of the prosperity cycle. It is as though a people could not learn from the mistakes of the past. Whenever any group chose to keep the commandments of God, he blessed and prospered them. The law of justice says God must do that. We keep the commandments. He blesses us. At that point, instead of returning constant thanks to him who had rewarded them, instead of acknowledge in humility that all that they had was a direct blessing from the Almighty, most of the people in the Book of Mormon, Nephites and Jaredites alike, lost sight of the source of their blessings. They traded the confidence of heaven for the approbation of men. Wealth became the end in life rather than a means to accomplishment of good. Whenever the acquisition of things becomes more important than people, 
and it was only a matter of time before class distinction, caste systems, and persecution of the poor followed. Wealth is a jealous master who will not be served half-heartedly and will suffer no rival, not even God. The more important wealth is, the less important is how one gets it. Brothers and sisters, somehow we have to learn how to live the gospel, be blessed, and how to live humbly in prosperity. The Nephites couldn't do it. Can we do it today? We have to if we're going to establish Zion to learn how to live in prosperity and be humble. Chapter 2, verse 13, the costliness of your apparel phrase meant, In the courts of the prince of darkness, a high seat of honor is accorded the designer of fashions, who throughout many generations of time has induced countless millions to trade fashion for fad, Comfort for ostentation, modesty for vanity. For such person it is not the appearance of the attire that matters, but rather the cost. The phrase costly apparel occurs more than a dozen times in the Book of Mormon. Almost always it is descriptive of people who have been prospered by the Lord, have become caught up with themselves and their acquisitions, and therefore have begun to place greater stress on the glitter of their outward appearance than the cleanliness of their inner vessel. That's a great warning for us today. Chapter 2, verse 14, the phrase, His judgments, meant the downward spiral of the prosperity cycle consists of the manifestation of God's judgments, meaning destruction and bondage. This is followed by humility, crying unto the Lord, and deliverance, which brings again the blessings of prosperity. Because it is not given that one man should possess that which is above another, no inequality or injustice shall go unchecked. Ultimately, all must answer, whether in life or in death. The phrase in verse 14, it must speedily come, meant, like the phrase, I come quickly. The phrase, speedily come, apparently refers to the suddenness of the judgment of God, rather than to their immediacy, that they will come all of a sudden. Chapter 2, verse 15, he can pierce you, meant God Almighty is a being of stern but appropriate justice, as well as a minister of tender mercy. And you and I decide which God he is, a God of stern justice or tender mercy by how we live the gospel and are obedient and repentant. He has power to both perceive and punish wickedness, and he will do so. He has power to remove the breath of life and return feeble man to the dust from whence he came, and he will do so. God will not be mocked. That we should keep in mind constantly. Chapter 2, verse 16, the phrase, Let not this pride destroy your souls. Pride destroys the soul through deflecting one's gaze from the things of eternity, through causing one to focus his affections upon things other than the true and living God, upon things that are spiritual and temporal and fleeting. Pride does not look up to God and care about what is right, President Ezra Taft Benson observed. Rather, it looks sideways to man and argues who is right. Pride is manifest in the spirit of contention. Was it not through pride that the devil became the devil? Christ wanted to serve. The devil wanted to rule. Christ wanted to bring men to where he was. The devil wanted to be above men. Christ removed self as the force in his perfect life. It was not my will, but thine be done. Indeed, President Benson declared, Humility responds to God's will, to the fear of his judgments and needs of those around us. To the proud, the applause of the world rings in their ears. To the humble, the applause of heaven warms their hearts. In the meridian of time, the Savior delivered a parable concerning one who trusted in his riches. This is from Luke 12. Take heed, the Lord warned, and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, 
and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine case, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou, that should be fool. Thou fool. Let's just turn that. Really quick tool would probably fit also with the, that phrase we use sometimes of people. They're foolish. They're a tool. Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? Jesus then reinforced the poignant lesson of the parable, saying, So is he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. In our day, that same Lord has cautioned in D&C 56, Woe unto you rich men that will not give your substance to the poor, for your riches will canker your souls, and this will be your lamentation in the days of visitation and of judgment and of indignation. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and my soul is not saved. Brothers and sisters, let us not make the mistake and think, well, I want to make a hundred thousand years. He's not talking about me. No, those of us who live in the Americas are rich compared to 85, 90% of the rest of the world. We have prosperity and abundance. Are we using it wisely? Chapter 2, verse 17, a couple of phrases let's consider. First, think of your brethren like unto yourselves, meaning that which we call the golden rule is not particular to the meridian of time. It has been the standard of the Lord's people from the beginning. It is not given to the Lord that one man should possess that which is above another. Consequently, until men and women learn to love, to take of the abundance which they possess and share with the less fortunate, the world will continue to lie in sin. The phrase, be familiar with all, referred to, Zion is characterized by a free and open union among people on social, economic, and spiritual grounds. Zion is a people who are of one heart and one mind, a people who dwell in righteousness, and there is no poor, no poor among them. Babylon contains cliques and caste systems and distance and discrimination. The word familiar is from the same root as the word family. To be familiar with all is to treat all men and women as members of the family, to extend the fellowship and love and resources of the family to all who stand in need, to establish Zion heaven on earth. Such is but a preparation for that which is to come. For we have been taught that the same societal, which society, society which exists among us here will exist among us there, mean the next life, only it will be coupled with eternal glory, which glory we do not now enjoy. The phrase that they may be rich like unto you, meaning wealth and poverty are relative. Many members of the church live in circumstances, enjoy privileges, which would be considered to be prosperous by others who enjoy appreciably less. It is a great blessing in this day and time to be able to have sufficient for one's needs. Members of the covenant community have promised to bear the burden of others, to mourn with those that mourn, and to comfort those who stand in need of comfort. For one who is prosperous to turn a deaf ear to the pleadings of the hungry or naked or lonely is to revel an unconvert is to reveal an unconverted soul and a withered sense of values. Only those members of the church who remember the poor and the needy, the sick and the afflicted, are entitled to the sacred designation of disciples of Christ. The language of the revelation is clear and direct regarding our duties, as well as regarding the dire consequences which will ultimately come to the selfish. If any man shall take of the abundance which I have made, and part not his portion, according to the law of my gospel, unto the poor and the needy, he shall, with the wicked, lift up his eyes in hell, being in torment, as said in Doctrine, 104, Doctrine and Covenants 104. Concerning fast offerings, and this is how we take care of the poor and the needy, Elder Joseph B. Worthland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles provided counsel regarding how much to contribute. Quote, how much should we pay in fast offerings? My brothers and sisters, the measure of our offering to bless the poor is a measure of our gratitude to our Heavenly Father. Will we, who have been blessed so abundantly, turn our backs on those who need our help? 
Paying a generous fast offering is a measure of our willingness to consecrate ourselves to relieve the suffering of others. Brother Marion G. Romney, who was the bishop of our ward when I was called on a mission and who later served as a member of the First Presidency of the Church, admonished, be liberal in your giving that you yourselves may grow. Don't just give for the benefit of the poor, but give for your own welfare. Give enough so that you can give yourself into the kingdom of God through the consecrating of your means and your time. Elder, end of quote by Elder Wordland and Mary G. Romney's quote. Chapter 2, verse 18. Before you seek for riches, seek ye for the kingdom of God. That phrase meaning personal purity is largely a product of priority, the singleness of spiritual vision. Where one's treasure is, there will his heart be also. Before seeking monetary success, it would be well if his or her heart were first focused away from self-gratification towards those things that matter most, the care of the children of God and the establishment of the kingdom of God. To the rich young man seeking eternal life, Jesus says, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and take up the cross and follow me. And the man was sad at the saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about and said unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of my Father? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus spake again and said unto them, Children, how hard it is for them who trust in their riches to enter into the kingdom of God. You see, God isn't against riches. He's against those who trust in them and put their faith in them. Back to Christ, he said, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And he meant that literally. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus looked upon them, said, With men that trust in riches, it is impossible, but not impossible with men who trust in God, and leave all for my sake, for with such all things are possible. See, there's the key. Those who trust in their riches, it will be impossible to be saved in exaltation. But those who put their trust in God and submit to his will, then they can read that salvation and exaltation. The emphasis of Zion, a society of the pure in heart, a holy commonwealth wherein there is no poor to be found, has been and must be the righteous obsession of the saints in any age. The Lord desires that every man may improve upon his talents, that every man may gain other talents, yea, even a hundredfold, to be cast into the Lord's storehouse, to become the common property of the whole church. Every man seeking the interest of his neighbor and doing all things with an eye single to the glory of God. Thus the clarion call of the master echoes through the centuries and provides the foundation upon which the prudent chart their course in life. Wherefore, seek not the things of this world, but seek ye first to build up the kingdom of God and to establish his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. Chapter 2, verse 19, after ye have obtained a hope in Christ, meant the faithful in all ages hope through the atonement of Christ and the power of his resurrection to be raised unto eternal life or exaltation. More specifically, the saints possess hope in Christ in the sense that they, through being willing to sacrifice all things for the gospel's sake, possess a knowledge that their course in life is pleasing to God. The Lord therefore identifies those who are willing to give up all things, their own lives included, for the furtherance of the kingdom, as being capable of handling wisely and judiciously a share of his worldly goods. The phrase, ye shall obtain riches if you seek them, meant, this statement must be viewed in its proper conduct. Seek not for riches, but for wisdom, the Lord explained to the Latter-day Saints. And behold, the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto you, and then you, and then shall you be made rich. Behold, he that hath eternal life is rich. The Lord later counseled his saints, If ye seek the riches which it is the will of the Father to give unto you, ye shall be the richest of all people. 
for ye shall have the riches of eternity, and it must needs be that the riches of my of the earth are mine to give. But beware of pride, lest you become as the Nephites of old. Surely not all those who have received a hope in Christ, who are true and faithful to every trust, and who further seek for riches, will prosper, be prospered, at least according to the puny standards of this world. Latter-day Saints must never succumb to the temptation so prevalent in the success-oriented and materialistic world to equate financial success with personal righteousness. To many righteous men and women, persons who have known true success in life have lived and died in horrible circumstances for us to suppose some type of causal relationship between nobility of the soul and monetary affluence. You will recall a previous sermon in which Jacob said, But woe unto the rich, who are rich as the things of the world. For because they are rich, they despise the poor, and they persecute the meek, and their hearts are upon their treasures. Wherefore, their treasure is their God. In any event, before ye seek for riches, seek ye for the kingdom of God, he assured them. And after you have received the hope in Christ, that then, if they still want riches, they will should obtain them. However, he tells them that then their wants will be for a different purpose. They will seek for riches only to do good. So you must shovel the money out the back door of the poor and the wealthy as fast as it's coming in the front door to you. Chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, Proud in Your Hearts. Pride is sometimes called the greatest sin of the spirit. It was Satan's sin in the premortal realm. Furthermore, Pride leads to failure and destruction, as the Lord repeatedly warns us. Beware of pride, lest thou should enter into temptation. D&C 23. For the hour is nigh, and the day soon at hand, when the earth is ripe, and all the proud, and they that do wickedly, shall be stubble, and I will burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts. That wickedness shall not be upon the earth. D&C 29. Be not ashamed, neither confounded, but be admonished in all your high-mindedness and pride, for it bringeth a snare upon your soul. D.N.C. 90. He that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that abaseth himself shall be exalted. D.N.C. 101. To Enoch the voice of God spoke, Unto you, brethren, I have I said, and also give commandment, that they should love one another, and they should choose me their father. But behold, they are without affection, and they hate their own blood. What was true in the earliest ages of the world was true in the days of Jacob, and is true in our day. One of the great admonitions of every era of earth's history, expect, ex, excepting only those sublime seasons wherein Zion was attained, is the trauma and tragedy associated with man's inhumanity to man. Indeed, man's treatment of his fellows is but a symbol of his disrespect for God. Why be proud in your hearts and afflict your neighbor because of the things God have given you? Jacob asked for a reason. What say ye of it? He wants them to ponder it in their hearts. Do you not suppose such things are abominable unto him who created all flesh? One man, he says, is as precious in the sight of God as another, and that for the same reason all are created to keep his commandments and thereby glorify him. There is a lesson we all may learn here. Pride too often leads our footsteps astray. It crowds all thoughts of God from our hearts. We are so engrossed in the world and the things thereof that we have no time or thought for other than what shall I eat, or what shall I drink, or what shall I be clothed. We forget his wisdom and guidance. It is then we should remember, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of God. When we recognize that great truth, all pride, envyings, hard-heartedness, and deceit will be banished, and in their place love of God and our fellow man will fill our hearts, and, and in humility we will recognize all men as brethren, they having one father, and we will profit by the lessons they teach us. Two, chapter 2, verse 23. They understood not the scriptures. That phrase meant, Paul explained that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 
Alma also explained to Helaman that the scriptures of the past have enlarged the memory of this people, yea, and convinced many of the error of their ways, and brought them to a knowledge of their God, unto the salvation of their souls. Some read the scriptures seeking understanding, desiring a remission of sins. Others quote scripture as a justification for their sins. The devil and his legions are adept at quoting scriptures. Jacob now turns to from speaking about pride and riches to even a grosser crime the Nephites are committing because they do not understand the scriptures, excusing themselves and committing whoredoms, sexual sins. As then, the Lord warned that sexual transgression would be a major problem among man mankind, even in the church. We see that today. President Ezra Taft Benson warned, the plaguing sin of this generation is sexual immorality. This, the prophet Joseph Smith said, would be the source of more temptations, more buffetings, and more difficulties for the elders of Israel than any other. Boy, and so it is. President Joseph F. Smith also warned, quote, There are at least three dangers that threaten the church within. And the authorities need to awaken to the fact that the people should be warned unceasingly against them. I see these. They are flattery of prominent men in the world, false educational ideas, and sexual impurity. Boy, have we seen false educational ideas with DEI and critical race theory and all the other nonsense that is being spewed out by those equity and all of that false philosophy. And boy, do we see sexual impurity. Sexual immorality is now seen as something that's proper and okay. The new morality is actually the old immorality. But the third subject mentioned, personal purity is perhaps the greater importance than either of the other two. We believe in one standard of morality for men and women. If purity of life is neglected, all other dangers set in upon us like the rivers of water when the floodgates are opened. End of prison, Joseph F. Smith's quote. Chapter 2, verse 24. Which things was abominable before me? Means, at issue here is the antecedent to the phrase, which thing? Those anger to condemn the practice of plural marriage in the early years of this dispensation have used this text to argue that Jacob is denouncing the practice of plural marriage altogether. Such is neither textual nor doctrinally correct. At various times, God has called upon his people to enter that marriage discipline given to Abraham, the practice known as plural marriage. There is no indication whatsoever in the Bible account that God was any way displeased or even concerned that Abraham took Hagar, Sarah's handmaid, to wife. In fact, we learn in fact in modern revelation that God himself commanded it. So God commanded Abraham to take Hagar to wife. That's in Doctrine and Covenants 132. Why then are the actions of David and Solomon spoken of as abominations? Why does the taking of plural wives by Abraham, Jacob, or Moses go uncondemned. Jacob was denouncing unauthorized marriages on the part of David and Solomon. Such constituted adultery, sexual sin against the marriage covenant. David's adulterous actions with Bathsheba one were unauthorized and condemned. Solomon's marriages to strange wives, which would be those not under the covenant and approved by God, to foreign women who turned his heart away from the everlasting covenant and the worship of the Lord Jehovah was unauthorized and condemned. Modern revelation places the entire question in a proper doctrinal and historic perspective. Quote, D.C. 132, Abraham received concubines, and they bore him children, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness, because they were given unto him by God. And he abode in my law, as Isaac also and Jacob did none other things than that which they were commanded. And because they did none other things than that which they were commanded, they have entered into their exaltation. 
and according to the promises, and sit upon thrones, and are not angels, but are gods. David also received many wives and concubines, and also Solomon, and Moses, my servant, as also many other of my servants from the beginning of creation until this time. And in nothing did they say sin, save in those things which they received not of me. David's wives and concubines were given unto him of me by the hand of Nathan, my servant, and others of the prophets who held the keys of this power. And in none of these things he did sin against me, save in the case of Uriah and his wife Bathsheba. And therefore he hath fallen from his exaltation, and received his portion, and he shall not inherit them, his wives, out of the world. For I gave them unto another, saith the Lord. 20, chapter 2, verse 26, the phrase, Do like unto them of old, referred to, because God has led the Lehites away from the gross wickedness found in the Eastern Hemisphere. He is pained at the thought that this New World remnant should become ensnared by the immorality, specifically adultery, practiced among their Old World kinsmen of the past. Chapter 2, verse 27, the phrase one wife meant the command given to Lehi and his colony is not unlike the, common, the command first given in our own dispensation, which Dr. Cummins 49 says, And again, barely I say unto you that whosoever forbiddeth to marry is not ordained of God, for marriage is ordained of God unto man. Wherefore it is lawful that he should have one wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. And all this, that the earth might answer the end of its creation, and it might be filled with the measure of man according to his creation before the world was made. Chapter 2, verse 28, the, the phrase, The Lord delighteth in the chastity of women. President Brigham Young stated, quote, Every virtuous woman desires a husband to whom she can look for guidance and protection through this world. God has placed this desire in woman's nature. It should be respected by the stronger sex. Any man who takes advantage of this and humbles a daughter of Eve to rob her of her virtue and cast her off dishonored and defiled is her destroyer and is responsible to God for the deed. In the refined Christian society of the 19th century, which tolerates such a crime, God will not. But he will call the prepper perpetuator to an account. He will be damned in hell. He will lift up his eyes, being in torment, until he has paid the utmost farthing and made a full atonement for his sins. Very strong words. Very, very serious sin. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles clearly defined the law of chastity when he taught, quote, any sexual intimacy outside of the bonds of marriage, I mean any intentional contact with the sacred private parts of another's body with or without clothing, is a sin and is forbidden by God. It is also a transgression to intentionally stimulate these emotions, emotions within your own body. End of quote. Elder Scott also affirmed the divine sanction of marital intimacy as well as divine com condemnation of sexual immorality, he warned, quote, Those intimate acts are forbidden by the Lord outside the enduring commitment of marriage because they undermined his purposes. Within the sacred covenant of marriage, such relationships are according to his plan. When experienced any other way, they are against his will. They cause serious emotional and spiritual harm. Even though participants do not realize that it is happening now, they will later. Sexual immorality carries a barrier to the influence of the Holy Spirit with all its uplifting, enlightening, and empowering capabilities. It causes powerful physical and emotional stimulation. In time, that creates an unquenchable appetite that drives the offender to even more serious sins. It engenders selfishness and can produce aggressive acts such as brutality, abortion, sexual abuse, and violent crime. Such stimulation can lead to acts of homosexuality, and they are evil and absolutely wrong. End of quote. Chapter 2, verse 30, the phrase, If I will raise up sin, I will command, referred to, 
This verse is the key to gaining an insight into what the Nephites understood in regards to the practice of plural marriage. They knew, as we do we, that monogamy was the rule, plural marriage the exception. They knew that unless God commanded otherwise, a man was to have but one wife. But they also knew from the accounts of the Old Testament prophets and peoples that God occasionally called upon his people to do otherwise, to raise up seed unto him through plural marriage. The directive so to do, however, was never been independent of that order and discipline common to the Lord's church and kingdom. It has come through holy men of God, men holding the keys of such power. In other words, those holding the keys of that power, the president of the church, is the only one that commands someone to do otherwise. That's whom God will work through. To the church and kingdom, it has come through, I'm sorry, to the saints in 1843, Joseph Smith said, I hold the keys of this power in the last days. For there is never but one on the earth at a time on whom the power and its keys are confirmed. And I have constantly said that no man shall have but one wife at a time, unless the Lord directs otherwise. And that direction would only have come through Joseph Smith because he held the keys. That direction will only come today through President Nelson because he's the one that holds the keys. Chapter 2, verses 31 through 35. Because of the wickedness and abomination of their husbands, many hearts died, pierced with deep wounds, referred to. Many Nephite husbands had broken the hearts of their wives and lost the confidence of their children. Families can be destroyed when the law of chastity is broken. Neil A. Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve, explained how more than just those who participate in sin are affected by the consequences. Quote, Unchastity and infidelity bring serious consequences, such as the rippling, even haunting effects of intimacy and fatherlessness, along with disease and the shredding of families. So many marriages hang by a thread or have already snapped. Therefore, the keeping of the seventh commandment is such a vital shield. By our lowering or losing that shield, the much-needed blessings of heaven are lost. No person or nation can prosper for long without those blessings. End of quote. You can see a lot of the bondage captivity in America today and destruction and judgment and things is because of sexual immorality. The foundation of a happy marriage in a celestial family unit is built upon love, fidelity, and trust. Nothing shatters hope and destroys feelings of worth and self-worth in members of the family like sexual infidelity on the part of a mother or father. Sorrow and mourning and blasted dreams follow in the wake of this insidious practice, this blatant form of betrayal and selfishness. It is a heinous crime against humanity, a sin which will be sorely punished by a just God whose heart is twin tender towards his offended ones. The gift procreation is a power which, when channeled and expressed appropriately within the bonds of matrimony, ennobles and sanctifies the union of man and woman. It is a gift from God our Father, and the righteous exercise of it, as in nothing else, we may come close to him. When, however, these sacred powers are abused or misused, sorrow and pain and guilt follow. Let's now turn to Jacob chapter 3. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, the phrase, that are pure in heart, meant, there is some counsel with attendant promises which is appropriate only to those who are pure in heart, to those who have kept themselves unspotted from the sins of the world. There are some things which apply only to the faithful, only to those who put their trust in God in the God of creation and thus reject the allurements of the God of this world. Chapter 3, verse 1, some phrases. Let's consider first the phrase firmness of mind meant 
To look to God with firmness of mind is to be constant and undeterred in one's progress towards that life which is like God's. It is to have undimmed vision of the plans and purposes of the Almighty, to enjoy peace and confidence in the Master as the tempest rages on all sides. To look to God with firmness of mind is to be, as Nephi said, steadfast in Christ, to pursue an undeviating course. The phrase, pray in time with exceedingly faith, meant virtue and purity give one confidence in God, allowing him to pray with the assurance that his prayers will be heard and to trust in the answers that are forthcoming. The phrase, he will console you in your afflictions, meant the rains of afflictions fall upon all who travail the path of mortality. The sunshine of relief from the vicissitudes of this world come through the powers from beyond this world. The people of God are entitled to the Spirit of God through the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is a revelator, a sanctifier, and a sealer. He is also a comforter. Quote, because the Holy Spirit speaks peace to the hearts of weary and discons disconsolate mortals, wrote Elder Bruce Conkey. He is called the Comforter. He brings peace and solace, love and quiet enjoyment, the joy of redemption, and the hope of eternal life. End of quote. The phrase, he will plead your cause, meant, though Christ suffered for all, he is justified in pleading only the cause of the righteous, those who repent and obey. Only those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, those who have become the children of Christ by covenant adoption, are entitled to the intercession of the Son. So that Christ, to have Christ plead my cause before the Father is not unconditional, it is conditional upon me following Christ. The phrase, send down justice upon those who seek your destruction, referred to, and speaking of the attribute of justice as that attribute centers in God, Joseph Smith taught, quote, Without the idea of the existence of the attribute justice in deity, men could not have confidence sufficient to place themselves under his guidance and direction, for they would be filled with fear and doubt, lest he and least the judge of all the world would not do right, and thus fear or doubt existing in the minds would preclude the possibility of exercising faith in him for life and salvation. See, if God wasn't just and punished the wicked, then we would be afraid that he wouldn't be just all the time. He might just do things willy-nilly. Further, in speaking of God's judgment, the prophet observed, quote, It is true. The exercise of this attribute, attribute of justice, that the faith in Christ, Christ Jesus are delivered out of the hands of those who seek their destruction. For if he, God, were not to come out in swift judgment against the workers of iniquity and the powers of darkness, his saints could not be saved. For it is by judgment that the Lord delivers his saints out of the hands of their enemies and those who reject the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because God is perfectly just, we can perfectly put our trust in him. Chapter 3, verse 2, the phrase, the pleasing word of God, meant there are some things that a righteous man or woman can come to understand that a sinful person can never know. Knowledge and intelligence, particularly in the realm of spiritual things, is dependent upon one's diligence and obedience. A knowledge of great doctrinal truth, what the scriptures call the mysteries of the kingdom, the peaceable things of immortal glory, that which bringeth joy, and that which bringeth eternal life eternal, a knowledge of these precious verities God reserves for those whom he can trust, the noble and God-fearing, those in fact who daily live worthy of the peace of the Spirit, shall eventually gain that ultimate peace, that final pleasing word of God. Come unto me, the blessed. There is a place prepared for you in the mansions of my Father. The phrase, a feast upon his love, meant to feast upon the love of God is to partake freely of the powers of the Savior's atonement and the blessings of his gospel. It is to sing the song of redeeming love, to glory in the salvation which is his, and to eat that bread of life and drink those living waters which are the food and drink of saved beings. 
chapter 3, verses 5 through 11, through 11. The Lamanites are more righteous than you, meaning the Nephites, refers to. The Lamanites, despite their dark and lowly existence in the days of Jacob, still are faithful to their wives and children, and in this sense are more righteous than many of the Nephites, who, professing membership in the church, revel in immorality and unauthorized plural marriages. As a protective hand of the Lord is withdrawn from them, any people who revel in whoredoms sow some degree of divine favor and promise of preservation rest upon the people of that nation, which keeps itself from the dark and damning influences of immorality. Notwithstanding their own vices, the Nephites constantly reproach and abused their brethren, the Lamanites, because of their habits and customs. They referred to them as filthy and as loathsome, forgetting that they too had many faults which were to be despised and scorned. He reminds them that the dark skin of the Lamanites and their violence were the rewards of simple lives led by the tradition of their fathers. Thus the Lamanites will one day become blessed people. There are many promises which are extended to the Lamanites, Alma explained to the wicked people of Ammonihah, for it is because of the tradition of their fathers that caused them to remain in their state of ignorance. Therefore, the Lord will be merciful unto them and prolong their existence in the land, and at some period of time they will be brought to believe in his words. See, the Nephites had his words, and they were now openly rebelling against him, so they would not be given that second option they would be under his divine justice and destruction would occur. The word of God was that you revile no more against them because of the things, and remember your own children, that you do not bring the same destruction upon them and thereby cause their sins be accounted against you in the great and terrible day of the Lord. To revile is to despise, to regard as vile, or to physically or verbally abuse, all of which are alien to the Spirit of God. We have been expressly commanded to revile not against revilers, or by doing, or by so doing we partake of the spirit of darkness. Jacob's counsel is in harmony with that of Jesus, which said, Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast the beam out of thine own eye, and thou shalt see clearly to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. Though it is true that each person who comes to earth is responsible to cleave to the truth and rejects falsehood, it is also true that in the eyes of the Lord, parents and grandparents bear the burden for that which they taught or failed to teach their offspring. Boy, there's some sobering words of counsel. Hence, Jacob pleads with the Nephites to awake and repent they do not experience the pains of hell and become subjected unto Satan, which is the second death. The first death which came upon Adam and Eve after their transgression in the Garden of Eden was a spiritual death. They were cast out of the presence of God and become dead as things to the Spirit, thus requiring them to be born again as to things of righteousness. Spiritual death ceases for those spirits who come up out of hell in the spirit world to receive an inheritance in the telestial world. So those who suffer in hell and will go to the telestial world will finally be relieved from spiritual death and at least inherit a telestial glory. All those in the telestial world do not receive the fullness of reward. They do receive of the Holy Spirit through the ministering of the terrestrial and consequently they are in the presence of the Lord in this sense, and are no longer spiritually dead. Pending in the day when they come forth in the second resurrection, they are spiritually dead. They have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. But when they come out of hell, spiritual death ceases for them. Thus eventually all are redeemed from spiritual death, except those who have sinned unto death, that is, those who are destined to be sons of perdition. Chapter 3, verse 10, the phrase, damage caused by poor examples. The children constantly learn from the examples set by those around them. Unfortunately, an unrighteous example can have a destructive influence on the young, 
Elder Jeffrey R. Holland is the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, Monty's parents in the church to demonstrate personal faith and righteousness to the children. Quote, I think some parents may not understand that even when they feel secure in their own minds regarding matters of personal testimony, they can nevertheless make the faith too difficult for the children to detect. We can be reasonably active, meeting going latter meeting going latter day saints, but if we do not live lives of gospel integrity and convey to our children powerful heartfelt convictions regarding the truthfulness of the restoration and the divine guidance of the church from the first vision to this very hour, then those children may to our regret but not surprise turn out not to be visibly active meeting going latter day saints or sometimes anything close to it. Not long ago, Sister Hall and I met a fine young man who came in contact with us after he had been roaming around through the occult and sorting through a variety of Eastern religions, all in an attempt to find religious faith. His father, he admitted, believed in nothing whatsoever, but his grandfather, he said, was actually a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But he didn't do much with it, the young man said, he was always pretty cynical about the church. From a grandfather who is cynical, to a son who is agnostic, to a grandson who is now looking desperately for what God had already once given his family. To lead a child or anyone else, even inadvertently away from faithfulness, away from loyalty and bedrock belief, simply because we want to be clever or independence is license no parent or any other person has ever been given. Live the gospel as conspicuously as you can. Keep the covenants your children know you have made. Give priesthood blessings and bear your testimony. Don't just assume your children will somehow get the drift of your beliefs on their own. End of quote. Our last chapter now, Jacob chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 4, the phrase that we knew of Christ referred to. The permanent duty of a prophet is to bear witness of Jesus Christ, for the testament of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Thus, be, since the beginning, the person, mission, and works of Jesus Christ were known and taught. Some 4,000 years before time's meridian, Adam was told of the coming of Jesus the Messiah into the world. Approximately 1,000 years later, Enoch saw in vision the Son of Man lifted upon the cross and crucified for the sins of the world. Abraham saw in vision the glorious day of the coming of the Son of Man and was made glad thereby. Nephi, son of Helaman, therefore explained that there are many before the days of Abraham who were called by the order of God, yea, even after the order of his Son, and this that it might be shown unto the people a great many thousand years before his coming that even redemption should come unto them. And now I would that ye should know that ever since the days of Abraham, there have been many prophets that have testified of these things. Chapter 4, verse 5, the phrase, Worship the Father in the name of Christ, meant Jacob's writings provide us with an important insight into the law of Moses and the Old Testament. In Jacob 4, 5, we learn that the Old Testament prophets prior to Jacob's time knew of both Christ and the Father as distinct individuals and appropriately worshipped the Father in Christ's name. The righteous from the beginning of time have had a correct concept of God the Father, that he is the only supreme governor and independent being in whom all fullness and perfection dwell, and that he is the Father of lights in him, the principle of faith dwells independently, and he is the object in whom the faith of all other rational and accountable beings center for life and salvation. God the Father is the ultimate object of our devotion and worship. We worship the Son in the sense that we emulate his example and seek to pattern our lives after his own immaculate life. Jacob's words indicate that the law of Moses was far more than simply a law of strict commandments and legal codes, as some modern scholars claim. The law of Moses testified of Jesus Christ and led the righteous to sanctification through the atonement of Jesus Christ. So there were those who lived the law of Moses and lived it to the point of their souls and who probably, on the direction of Moses, gained the higher priesthood and the higher gospel, while most of Israel did not understand the law of Moses that way. 
Sanctification is a process whereby one is made pure and holy, a process which is accomplished only through the cleansing of blood of Christ, in correct with the medium of the Holy Ghost, in concert with the medium of the Holy Ghost. It comes through yielding one's heart to God. Sanctification is a result of single minded obedience, a blessing known only to those who have made their whole souls as an offering unto Him. Can we completely turn our lives over to Him? That is when we become sanctified. Elder Bruce McConkie has written, quote, Just as our conformity to gospel standards, while dwelling as lowly mortals apart from our Maker, prepares us to return to His presence with an inheritance of immortal glory, so the Mosaic standard prepared the chosen of Israel to believe and obey that gospel by conformity to which eternal life is won. Further, he said, to gain the celestial kingdom, the Lord says, you must be sanctified through the law, which I have given you, even the law of Christ, which law is the fullness of the gospel. The revealed word specifies that those who obtain the celestial glory must be able to abide the law of a celestial kingdom. In other words, salvation in a celestial kingdom will come to all those who are able to live the full law of Christ even though they did not have the opportunity to do so in the course of a mortal probation. Thus, all those who, keep the, who kept the law of Moses, who lived the law of the preparatory gospel to the full, thus establishing that they were able to live the Lord's law, will in due course gain a celestial inheritance. So there must have been a minority of those in the ancient Israel during Moses' time who understood the law of Moses. It pointed their souls to Christ. They lived it the law of Moses as they were supposed to and had faith in Christ. Therefore, they will one day also inherit the higher gospel ordinances and inherit the celestial kingdom. Chapter 4, verse 5, the phrase, even as it was accounted unto Abraham, means Abraham was commanded to offer his son Isaac, a thing which would have been abhorrent to anyone who knew perfectly well of divine prohibitions against human sacrifice and murder. Yet Abraham never so much as thought to sit in judgment of his God. He did not refuse. He knew the voice of God, and he knew that whatever God commanded was right. He obeyed, and thus it was accounted unto him for righteousness. In the same manner, even though the law of Moses was a lesser law, a preparatory gospel, the Nephites, knowing full well of the law and its purpose, though not to sit in judgment upon it or their God, they obeyed it, and it was accounted unto them for righteousness. It, it prepared them for Christ and the higher gospel. Verse, chapter 4, verse 5, the phrase, A similitude of God and his only begotten Son. This is in reference to Abraham sacrificing his son Isaac, that that was a similitude of God and his only begotten Son. Elder Melvin J. Ballard has taught the following concerning this similitude, quote, I think as I read the story of Abraham's sacrifice of his son Isaac, that our father is trying to tell us what it cost him to give his son as a gift to the world. Have you ever thought of it that way? What was the price Heavenly Father paid? We don't talk about that much. We know the price that Christ paid in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross and sweating blood from every pore. But what did it cost the father? Back to Elder Ballard's quote. Abraham and Isaac ascended the mountain, gathered the stones together, and placed the faggots upon them. Then Isaac was bound, hand and foot, kneeling upon the altar. I presume, I presume Abraham, like a true father, must have given his son his farewell kiss. His blessing, his love, and his soul must have been drawn out in that hour of agony towards his son, who was to die by the hand of his own father. Every step proceeded until the cold still was drawn and the hand raised that was to strike the blow to let out the life's blood when the angel of the Lord said, It is enough. Our Father in Heaven went through all of that and more, for in his case the hand was not stayed. He loved his son, Jesus Christ, better than Abraham ever loved Isaac. For our Father had with him his son, our Redeemer, in the eternal worlds, 
faithful and true for ages, standing in a place of trust and honor. And the father loved him so dearly, and yet he allowed this well-beloved son to descend from his place of glory and honor, where millions did him homage, down to the earth, a condescension that is not within the power of man to conceive. He, Christ, came to receive the insult, the abuse, and the crown of thorns. God heard the cry of his son in that great moment of grief and agony in the garden when the pores of his body opened and drops of blood stood upon him, and he cried out, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. I ask you, what father and mother could stand by and listen to the cry of their children in distress in this world and not render assistance? I have heard of mothers throwing themselves into raging streams when they could not swim a stroke to save their drowning children, rushing into burning buildings to rescue those whom they loved. We cannot stand by and listen to those cries without it touching our hearts. The Lord has not given us the power to save our own. He has given us faith, and we submit to the inevitable. But he had the power to save, and he loved his son. He referring to Heavenly Father. And he, the Father, loved his son. And he, the Father, could have saved him. He might have rescued him from the insults of the crowds. He might have rescued him when the crown of thorns was placed on his head. He might have rescued him when the son, hanging between two thieves, was mocked with, Save thyself and come down from the cross. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. He listened to all of this. He saw that the son condemned. He saw him drag the cross through the streets of Jerusalem and faint under its loads. He saw the son finally upon Calvary. He saw his body, his body stretched out upon the wooden cross. He, the father, saw the cruel nails driven through the hands and feet and the blows that broke the skin and tore the flesh and let out the life's blood of his son. He looked upon that. In the case of our father, the knife was not stayed, but it fell, and the life's blood of his son went out. His father looked on with great grief and agony over his beloved son, until there seems to have come a moment when even our Savior cried out in despair, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that hour, I think I can see our dear Father behind the veil, look upon these dying struggles, even until he could not endure it any longer. And like the mother, who bids farewell to her dying child and has to be taken out of the room so as not to look upon the last struggles, so he, Heavenly Father, bowed his head and hid in some part of his universe, his great heart almost breaking for the love that he had for his son. Oh, in that moment when he might have saved his son, I thank him and praise him that he did not fail us for he had only the love of his son in mind. He, for he had not only the love of his son in mind, but he also had the love for us. I rejoice that he did not interfere and that his love for us made it possible for him to endure to look upon the sufferings of his son and gave him finally to us, our Savior and our Redeemer. Without him, Without his sacrifice, we would have remained, and we would have never have come glorified in his presence. And so that is what it cost him part, for our Father in heaven to give the gift of his Son unto men. End of quote. Brothers and sisters, I think we need to pay more attention to what it cost Heavenly Father, the pain and agony that must have swelled up in his soul to watch all that his son had to go through when he could have just reached down and grabbed his son and took him back home. He did not give in to that. He watched his son go through it all. And so I thank the father for not giving in and for letting it all take place. 
chapter 4, verse 6, the phrase, having all these witnesses, we obtain a hope, means the spirit of prophecy and revelation, the gifts and wonders of the spirit, the presence and operation of these things, evidence or witness that one is approved of God. That feeling of approval, that sign or divine acceptance, is the inevitable, incapable of being imitated or copied foundation for a hope in Christ, a hope to be raised unto life eternal. The Spirit of the Lord and the doctrines which flow from it plant and nurture hope in the heart of the obedient. Chapter 4, verse 6, the phrase, We truly can command in the name of Jesus, referred to, the priest of bearer who knows that his course in life is pleasing to the Lord is possessor of that faith by which he can work miracles. He has confidence in his God and confidence in his own abilities to know and carry out the will of heaven. He is then able to operate by faith in all aspects of life. We understand, Joseph Smith taught, that when a man works by faith, he works by mental exertion instead of physical force. It is by words instead of exerting his physical powers with which every being works when he works by faith. Faith then works by words, and with these its mightiest works have been or will be performed. Now we have to make a caution here. You can't just say whatever you want and it's going to happen. In offering insightful commentary on these inspired ideas, Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote and warned us, but working by faith is not the mere speaking of a few well-chosen words. Anyone with the power of speech could have commanded the rotten corpse of Lazarus to come forth. But only one whose power was greater than death could bring life again to the brother of Mary and Martha. Nor is working by faith merely a mental desire, however strong, that some eventuality should occur. I just think hard enough and it will happen. No, that's not faith. That's not working by faith. There may be those whose mental powers and thought processes are greater than any of the saints, but only persons who are in tune with the infinite can exercise the spiritual forces and powers that come from him. Those who work by faith must first have faith. Faith is doing what God wants. It's what he tells you to do. Back to Elder McConkie. No one can use a power he does not possess. And the faith or power must be gained by obedience to those laws on which its, recipient, its receipt is predicated. And then, when the day is at hand and the hour has arrived for the miracle to be wrought, then they must be in tune with the Holy Spirit of God. In other words, when God tells you to say something, mountain be removed, tree be removed, person be healed, when the Holy Spirit tells you, then you act in faith. It has to be according to God's will. Back to McConkie. He who is the author of faith, he whose powerful faith is, he whose works are the embodiment of justice and judgment and wisdom and all good things, even he must approve the use of his power in the case at hand. Faith cannot be exercised contrary to the order of heaven or contrary to the will and purposes of him whose power it is. Men work by faith when they are in tune with the Spirit and when they seek to do by mental exertion and by the spoken word is the mind and will of the Lord. So you and I can command in faith for things to happen when it's the will of God. Then we work by words. The words of the Holy Ghost tell us what to say. Chapter 4, verse 7, the phrase, Nevertheless, the Lord showeth us our weaknesses. The Lord often provides reminders to his servants and of their ever-present need to rely upon him. Frequent memory jogs as to their human limitations to show us that we might know it was by the power of God and through his grace that we did these things and not by any power we ourselves possess. The phrase, his great condescensions, meant Christ is the vine and other branches. To the twelve, Jesus says, he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. 
without his great condescension, his sustaining love, his tender mercies, his matchless powers, man can never rise above a carnal and regenerated state. So thank goodness that Christ came down and accomplished all that he accomplished or we could not be saved. We would be eternally lost in hell. Chapter 4, verse 8, the phrase, Great and marvelous are the works of the Lord, meant God's work and glory is to transform a meager mortal into a glorious celestial being. These truths, the truths about God and his nature, though they are mysteries to the world, mis they are mysteries to the world mysteries in which, strangely enough, many in the Christian world choose to glory, are truths which are meant to be known and understood by those aspiring to be like God. They cannot be discovered by scientific methodology, nor in the rational wanderings of the learned. God stands revealed, or he remains forever unknown. Those only to whom it is revealed knows his marvelous ways. Wherefore, brother Jacob admonished, despise not the revelations of God. Despise means scorn, disdain, disregard, spurn, or contempt. Remember, when a true is revealed to God, it becomes at once a solemn ob when a truth is revealed of God, it becomes at once a solemn obligation upon each individual. It is given as the Apostle Paul says for us to heed. It is not to be ignored or in any way made inconsiderable. Chapter four, verse ten Seek not to counsel the Lord. Meant. President Mary and Giron in the first panel explained what it meant to counsel the Lord. Quote, now I do not think that many members of the church consciously urge the persuasions of men or their own counsel instead of heeding the Lord's. However, when we do not keep ourselves advised as what the counsel of the Lord is, we are prone to substitute our own counsel for his. As a matter of fact, there is nothing else we can do but follow our own counsel when we do not know the Lord's counsel. End of quote. And where do we get that? Every six months, and in the scriptures, and from the Spirit. Surely no mortal would ever be so presumptuous to seek counsel, to seek to counsel the Almighty. And yet we do just that when our trust is placed in the arm of flesh or whenever we follow after our own whims, when we fail to take seriously the counsel of living prophets, or when we become impatient with the Lord's time scheme. We must never forget that it is not the work of God that is frustrated, but the work of man. For although a man may have many revelations and have power to do many mighty works, yet if he boasts in his own strength and sets at naught the counsels of God and follows after the dictates of his own will and carnal desires, he must fall and incur the vengeance of a just God upon him, meaning he will have to live the consequences of his wrongful actions. Chapter 4, verse 11, the phrase, Be reconciled unto him through the atonement, meant through sin man alienates himself from God and widens the ch chasm between himself and the heavens. All men live in a fallen world and remain in a fallen state as natural men, enemies to God and to all righteousness, without the atoning grace and mediation of Christ the Lord. Thus our need to be reconciled, meaning brought back into fellowship, with God through the atonement of Jesus Christ and our obedience to him and his commandments and laws. As the Apostle Paul said, For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now receive the atonement, meaning reconciliation, restoration to favor. Then ye may obtain a glorious resurrection, a resurrection entitling you to the exaltation of the celestial kingdom. The ancient saints faithfully endured trials and tribulations that they might obtain a better resurrection, or as Joseph Smith render, rendered it, the first resurrection, meaning the celestial resurrection. The phrase in chapter 11, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 11, the first fruits of Christ, what does that refer to? Alfred Edersheim, who was a great 1800s uh, Christian scholar, has written, quote, As a family feast, the presentation of the first fruits 
would enter more than any other right into family religion and family life among those of ancient Israel. Not a child in Israel, Israel, or at least of those who inhabited the Holy Land, for only that grown the Holy Land was thus sanctified, could have been ignorant of all connected with this service. For scarcely had a brief eastern spring merged into early summer when the first appearance of ripening fruit, whether on ground or on trees, each household would prepare for this service. The head of the family, accompanied by his children, would go into his field, mark off certain portions from the most promising of the crop, for only the best might be presented to the Lord, and it was set apart before it was yet ripe and solemn dedication being however afterwards renewed when it was actually cut. Thus each time anyone would go into the field, he would be reminded of the ownership of Jehovah till the reapers cut down the golden harvest. So the best portion of trees of the orchard or wheat in the wheat field was set apart, and that was cut and then offered in the temple as the first fruits that was offered in behalf of Christ being the first fruit. So they would offer their best first fruits of their crops every year as a sacrifice in the temple. This ritual of offering up the first fruits to Jehovah at the time of harvest was symbolic of and pointing to the righteous becoming the first fruits of God on account of their righteousness. Christ with the faithful are thus the first fruits unto God. Christ was the first fruits of the resurrection, the great and last sacrifice, the one foreordained and set apart to be the first fruits of them that slept, the first to be presented in resurrected glory in the heavenly temple. There were no resurrections on the planet earth before his. It would appear that Jacob's phrase, first fruits of Christ, is a description of those souls who have been consecrated and dedicated to his service and who thereby qualify for the highest resurrection and place in the celestial kingdom. So just as the certain of the fields was set apart, the best part, we are to set apart ourselves to Christ and become the first fruits of Christ. We must set aside our will and only do his will. And that way we become the first fruits. Chapter 4, verse 13, the phrase, Let him prophesy to the understanding of men, meant, that is, let him speak with the power of plainness. Speak so that his message may be heard and comprehended. Let him speak unto men according to their language and according to their understanding. The phrase, the Spirit speaketh the truth, meant, the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of truth, the means by which the saints come to know the truth of all things. He is the Comforter, has all knowledge, and is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Jacob's definition of truth is appropriately close to that contained in modern revelation. Doctrine and Covenants 93 says, And truth is knowledge of things as they are, and as they were, and as they are to come. Meaning, things as they really are, and things as they really will be. That's how Jacob said it. And whatsoever is more or less than this is the spirit of the wicked one, who is a liar from the beginning. The spirit of truth is of God. So for something to be true, brothers and sisters, it would have to be true in the past, true in the present, and true in the future. That's how you know something is true and is of God. Marriage, marriage between a man and a woman, is ordained of God, was true. That was the law before we came here. That is the law now, and that will be the law in the eternities. Immorality is sin. Always was been a sin now, and immorality will be a sin in the future. That is the truth. So, for something to be true, it has to be something was, is, and will be. Chapter 4, verses 14 through 18, the phrase, looking beyond the mark, meant, while serving in the 70, Elder Dean L. Larson explained that the Israelites in ancient times got themselves into great difficulty because they placed themselves in serious jeopardy in spiritual things, because they were unwilling to accept simple, basic principles of truth. They entertained and intrigued themselves with things that they could not understand. 
They were apparently afflicted with pseudo-sophistication and a snobbishness that gave them a false sense of super superiority over those who came among them with the Lord's words of plainness. They went beyond the mark of wisdom and prudence and obviously failed to stay within the circle of fundamental gospel truths, which provide a basis for faith. They must have reveled in speculative and theoretical matters that obscured for them the fundamental spiritual truths. As they became infatuated by these things, they could not understand their comprehension and faith in the redeeming role of a true Messiah was lost and the purpose of life become confused. A study of Israel history will confirm Jacob's allegations. And so they turn the gospel into some com complex, complicated thing of laws and, and performance and ordinances that you had to perform perfectly, which no one could perform perfectly. That's why the law couldn't save you. And the simple, basic saving truths of coming unto Christ were lost unto them. And so when Christ came, they would not recognize him as their saving Messiah. We too take and make the church complicated and get caught up in programs and thinking that if we just live those, we will be saved. Brothers and sisters, there's no saving power in any program in this church. Even going to the temple, that program, there's no saving power in it without the atonement of the Savior of Jesus Christ. And so our focus must always be on him and not make this complicated more than we need to enter into covenants of baptism and get received the Holy Ghost, follow the Holy Ghost with steadfastness, feasting upon the words Christ, and then later enter into the full covenants of the temple, washing anointings, endowment, and celestial marriage, and then you can gain eternal life. The gospel is that plain and that simple. It's just we have to make up our minds if we want to live it and endure to the end. Eleanor A. Maxwell explained how looking beyond the mark can be avoided today. Quote, this incredible blindness which led to the rejection of those truths spoken by the prophets and which prevented the recognition of Jesus for who he was, according to Jacob, came by looking beyond the mark. Those who look beyond plainness, beyond the prophets, beyond Christ, and beyond his simple teachings, waited in vain then as they will wait in vain now. For only the gospel of Jesus Christ teaches us of things as they really, as they really are and as they really will be. End of quote. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for watching. And hopefully this helped you with some of the teachings of Jacob. What a great gospel teacher. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button.